where you have the development of these overlying dom, uh, uh, relatively st uh, cyclically, cyclically stable uh, political uh, uh, organs, like empires. And you have a cyclical relationship to our uh, the essential truth that we hold. We're all going to be living dominated under regimes of alienation. That cannot be helped by an individual, so therefore it must be lived with. And the way you live with it is you grasp that we are all part of one experience and that whatever we're living in in this life is some uh, connection to what we had lived previously and that our actions on this life will affect where we end up. But none of it is worth sweating because it's all one thing and it will inevitably be knit together. And if it's inevitably knit together, then you really don't have to worry about anything because why are we afraid of dying? We're afraid of... Uh, an inevitable oblivion. No. Inevitable oblivion is experienced subjectively because we can't experience death. It is experienced subjectively as reunion. So we don't have to sweat it. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm shoveling shit in this life. Maybe I'll uh, be riding a horse in the next life. And then when it's all over, we could all look back at what happened and laugh. So that's the stable relationship that you have in this verdant reality. But in the ass end of Central Asia, where, where what had been uh, uh, fertile fields become fucking deserts, and you still have, though, these well-established agricultural communities that leave a demographic um, footprint that has to be socially related. How is it socially related? By people gaining into tribes, uh, and then fighting it out until uh, an empire is formed, it falls apart, the parts fall, fight each other. And amongst these tribes, one of the most marginal established this written tradition around the idea of a uh, uh, transcendental God that they can be in constant communion with through cooperation with their fucking neighbors as one organ in a way that these... Uh, regimes of imperial dominion in the center do, which is to just reinforce these narrow parochial fam filial ties, individual families connected root-like to a central nerve, en uh, a social engine, uh, but arrayed against each other. You have a social organism, and but it finds itself by the time of Christ Dominated by these fucking pagans, by these the the the, the uh, Romans who who take the uh, red and tooth and claw world of dominion as right over, and stamp it across the entire area, and and stamp the Jews with it too, because the Jews exist as a patron state to the Roman Empire, and as such are subject to it and are influenced by it. And it's not, it's experienced as like a cultural clash, but it is also an imposition of the Roman economic model. And Christ sees this, and how, how can he address his specific political reality? To tell the people, hey, uh, you know the Messiah we keep talking about? That's me. If we all except that I'm the Messiah, then anything we do, if it's fight the Romans to the death, or it's beat the Romans, establish a stable social order, and then live as real brothers within it, because I am now the conduit. You don't have to read the Torah all the, uh, and, and sit with the question. The question has been answered. It's me. Let's go. Because whatever happens, this is the important part, we will all experience it together at the same time. It will either be a Masada, collective Masada, which is still going to heaven, or it will be building heaven on earth. Now, given the conditions he was facing, it wasn't a bad plan, but it was a long shot and it failed. I do think, I've said this before, I think when Christ showed up before Pilate, he expected 
himself to be saved by the intercession of God in the form of the, the citizens of the city rising as one. He thought that was going to be the trigger point. But they say, now give us Barabbas. You're actually kind of weird. Because, of course, he's a weird guy. He's, he's a weird guy talking to some weirdos. And so then his sacrifice, okay, this is the point. Because at no point is, is, is Christ not still feeling this connection. Like, he's still wired in. He can't unwire, even as he's being flayed. And I, like, maybe he did live for three more days after after he got uh, uh, taken off the cross. Because, like, it's not like shooting somebody in the head or cut, or getting decapitated. You die by asphyxiation when you're up on a cross. You could lose signs of life, be pulled down, and then regain it later. It's totally, especially if you go into some sort of spiritual trance, say. So you use breathing to focus your, your consciousness and overcome sensations of personal, uh, of, of pain and like basically glitch out of existence. And then you can come back into your body. You have been resurrected. They've seen it. Now it would have stayed though a cult, except for the fact that Christianity solved a real social problem for the expanding Roman empire. As the Roman empire grabs more and more territory, it starts administering more and more alien polities. And that means that social conflict between parts of the empire build up like fucking uh, dirt in the engine. And then, of course, you have the fact that there's constant churning class co conflict at the very heart of the Roman Empire between the slaves on one hand and, and, the, and the free population, but then also between the landed uh, free population and the landless, the, the, the plebs and the patricians. And this is this is this churning always, and it needs to be... Uh, uh, dealt with. The Roman Empire for a while deals with it through expansion, like all empires do. It claims more and more territory and buys off social conflict while creating, setting the stage for future conflict. It reaches a point of maximum expansion under Trajan and starts to retract. And you see these cyclical conflicts emerge at the heart of the Roman Empire. And it keeps falling and rising, really, but it, uh, dynastically. The, the polity remains for a while because it was so long enduring, and it's hard to get rid of that thing overnight. That means that the, the, uh, the regime's, the mandate of heaven, the regime's social uh, legitimacy is every day undermined. How do you replace that? Christianity is essentially a software patch. And as soon as you get that, as soon as you get the adoption by the Roman Empire of Christianity, and these, this new Christian context for sublimating all of the social conflict within the Roman Empire, as it collapses, Then you need some new stanchions, some new social structures. And Christianity does the job, but not by promising, as Christ did, that we would all be redeemed on earth together. We would live in the we would live in heaven on earth. We would live, we would build it here, which was the promise of Christianity and why early Christians lived in common in a state of apocalyptic anticipation. Is this good enough? Is this good enough? Is this it? But they were, of course, competing with a structure that couldn't accommodate that, and they were obliterated. They were driven back into the, the social relations that dominated the empire. And then the empire takes that message and says, there is, uh, there is this land, but it is not here, and it will not be experienced by all of us at once. Well, maybe. We'll see. It might happen. But we're not really working towards it so much as waiting for it. And in the meantime, you got to do what you got to do. But we'll all be brought together at the end because early Christianity and into the Middle Ages, we really don't get this reversed until modern evangelical Christianity emerges, which is really self-worship by that point. Uh, it's understood that you don't go to heaven when you die. You are resurrected at the end time, judged and then brought into the bosom of Christ if you follow the rules. 
So it's it's it is apology. It is a promise of social harmony, but uh, on the installment plan, you're going to have to trust us, and the, their ability to to wield that is determined by their ability to build social legitimacy, which they do because when the Roman Empire, uh, even as the Roman Empire is cr cr collapsing. Christianity has built such strong structures of social reproduction around in the church that it survives and it's reached and it structures the new regimes of control that come up. So once when anarchy is allayed by the establishment of feudalism from these Germanic warlords, basically uh, doing a protection racket on Roman merchants you have the church to sanctify the entire process and to say, look, we had chaos, now we have order, and it is them to thank. We have priests who will say that. And you basically just reconsecrated the old Hobbesian pre-Christian social world because you're fighting against each other immediately. But there is still an apocalyptic heart in Christianity that keeps beating. And at times of crisis, it expresses itself spontaneously as this cultural cry, this yawp, this, this, this yearning to escape this prison. And the knowledge that if enough of us did believe, we could do it. If enough of us believed, by God, we could do it. Now, they set about trying to create believers by doing it at the sword, but the whole time they're making sure that real Christian fellow feeling could never emerge because... Uh, regimes of labor exploitation, of, uh, of, of serfs working for nobles, rips them away from each other. So nobody's really working towards Christ. They're working towards themselves already. Already. We don't have the full liberal social self yet, but it's a it is a fossil in the process that kicks us from one social reality to another. And of course, now the Jews are along, the people who created this fucking thing, and who, because they live, they keep the tribe together, they're able to keep the, the written heart of the thing alive and beating and extend it outward, they become the vent. These are the people responsible. This is why we're not happy. This is why we don't all have Christian institutions, really. This is why we, we, ha we don't have heaven on earth and they're suffering. It's because the fucking Jews, even though what they're doing is trying to preserve what they'd had, which the pagans who got converted to Christianity had never had. And uh, there's an interesting reading of uh, the book of Revelation, that which is the evangelical Christian's favorite fucking book of the Bible. Ever since the millennium, it's been the one they focus on. Uh, the Left Behind series, all that stuff, is actually written by a Jew, a Jewish Christian, as a warning about what would happen if the religion got consumed by the new influx of former pagan Christians who didn't have a social rooting in Judaism. What would they do to the church? That's why they needed... Armageddon to happen as soon as possible to stop that from happening. And so the very people that John of Patmos was worried about are now the people who are most fetishistically devoted to carrying out the book of Revelation. They are the fucking pagans who never had a... a, a the Judeo-Christian thing is bullshit because Ju Judaism, it gives birth to the Christian tradition, but it is also uh, defined by its rupture with it. So you're saying nothing by saying Judeo-Christian. Christian is the pagan world of red and tooth and claw. By this, by this sign of the sword, I conquer. God gives me not because God gives me favor, not because I am a member of a group that has obligations to one another, not that I have uh, uh, carried out His will and fulfilled His uh, His uh, commands of me, but because I fucking won the fight. with this new Christian notion that there's a heaven somewhere that believing in Christ will get you there. And it's divorced from the social reality, but the social, the social reality that, that uh, caused early Christians to start appearing among the pagans, among the slaves and among the guilty nobles and merchants who were 
stuck between the two. Merchants first of all. Always merchants first of all. The ones stuck between the land and the palace. They are adhering to it because hey, this I could live this life. If you're if you're if you're an earl if you're a uh, a merchant in uh, second century Roman Empire, the Levant, and you're struggling to live and struggling to survive and seeing horrible violence carried out in the name of the sovereign all the time, uh, you want an escape from that. And if you're a merchant and you're not s s tied into a relationship where you are either working for someone or you are dominating and supervising and controlling another, then you can feel the autonomy to try to build that. And they did. The early Christians did try to live communally. But it was not possible in competing with self-interest because it is a superior survival machine. But the thing is, we're all on this earth together. We can all fucking cooperate. We can put our heads together. It is not a survival question if we recognize it as such which is easier to fucking say when you live among plenty, when you live in superabundance, which you don't have where these religions emerge. So when the apocalyptic vision comes to Christianity, as it does at the uh, turn of the millennium, as it does in the 1500s, when the Reformation occurs, uh, it is this swelling yearning to align our understanding, our social understanding, our emotional understanding of what Christ is with the world that we find ourselves living in. And that is all the millenary movements, the Anabaptists, the, the, the fucking Hussites, they're all powered by this. But they can only be expressed through social structures, which are dominated by the owning class. So it all gets institutionally captured. And if there's a rebellion to go along with it, it's put down bloodily. And it's eventually extinguished around the 1700s. And that God dies. The God who's going to bring us all together in a supernatural reunion, in, in a huge... God just is showing up one day and giving everybody a big hug. Like that as a imagined social reality. Like a horizon that we describe to ourselves, imagine in our minds, depict in our art, and reflect back to us aesthetically. We're trying to get that. And and then the, the Reformation is a grasp for that. The Thirty Years' War, and the, the early modern uh, era, all those revolutions and revolts, it's all grasping towards it. But it's all failing because there has not cohered a working class capable of really controlling technology. They are still at the ass end of this relationship. They are, they are uh, geographically and mentally too far from power to do anything other than provide uh, fuel for an inter-ruling class conflict, or rather between one element of the uh, one uh, one element of the ruling class and another, the holders of capital and the holders of land. I'm not a repressed believer. I'm a believer. I didn't used to be, but I am now. It's cool. But that dies. And it's replaced by this collective materialism. We think we still have Christianity, but we really don't. Uh, we have this Enlightenment conception that suffuses everything. And which, by the way, the fact that it suffuses everything is exactly what makes all the morons who want to erase the Enlightenment so tedious. They don't. They don't realize time is moves in one direction, and that it builds social realities in one direction. And once you've gotten to that level of abstraction, you can't go back unless you have a, a complete collapse of social conditions and a wiping away of the of the of the board. Now, that is what reactionaries want because they want to die in battle. Like there's two types of, of uh, people under capitalism at the top, and their uh, religions, their worldviews, they might have different vocabularies given time or place. But under undergirding them is a central difference. 
One group wants to die in battle, and the other group wants to die in their bed. One group wants to be annihilated in righteous combat with a foe. The other group wants to be surrounded by lo loved ones and told that they were a good person. I should write the Orange Catholic Bible, honestly. I might do that. Um, but the urge doesn't go anywhere. It's uh, Christianity is now captured by the ruling power. Christianity means rule by an elite. Because we have to rule in order to decide who goes to heaven and who goes to hell and all this bullshit. It's all packed up in the church they've built. And they own it completely. Uh, because there's no more social reproduction of it. Because the, the uh, relationship between the peasantry the land-based people and their local religious authority has been uh, annihilated one way or the other. It's been alienated. People have been pulled up, tore out, th thrown into the cities where they don't have that relationship. So they cannot reproduce God in a religious sense. But because they are the bottom half, they can imagine it in a physical sense. Like, oh, we can have heaven on earth. Not because Jesus is going to show up, but because we are going to overthrow those who rule us and then treat each other the way we want to be treated, which we've learned from the experience of being mutually exploited. And so the continuation of Christianity as it unfolds in an attempt to deal with the, the uh, increasing technological regime of accumulation that overawes life on the planet Uh, the socialist movement, broadly stated, with Marxism as the approximation of a holy book at its heart, because you need a book. It becomes the next phase of a materialized Christianity that has given up on the hope of going to heaven because it can't believe that that world exists anymore because they can't feel it, they can't taste it. They now live in their head in a way that they didn't before. But we can come together because we believe in each other enough, we love each other enough, and what is love but not an expression of this very thing that we're trying to embody? And in that love, we can overthrow these people, destroy their old gods, uh, and build on earth uh, a life that will allow us, even if we don't believe there's anything after death but a big black curtain, allow us to die easily, allow us to, allow us to live and then die peacefully. Now, again, there's still going to be people who want to die in battle, but that can be socially productive. That urge can be sublimated into something productive if you're surrounded by uh, a positive social feedback loop. And so that is how you get a society where you've knitted together all these seemingly deep, like, this is human nature contradictions. You can knit them all together, but only if you collectively, as a working class, seize control of this machinery and the 20th century and the 19th and 20th century from 18 i would say 18 uh, 1789 yes 1789 to 1945 is armageddon it is a series of battles between christianity which is actually satanism the worship of the self against christianity the the socially embedded religious tradition coming from the bottom. No, I not some, some people say 91, not 91, because as soon as the Yanks get the bomb, the war is over. It's just a question of how long it will take for the armistice to be signed. And it took until 1991. But as soon as the Yankees have the nukes, it's over because this is a real battle. This is not a war of positions. I think this is how you have to understand this. This is a life and death Blood fight. This is a literal holy war. And it's fought everywhere. And after 1945, they keep fighting it, but they keep they start fighting it outside of Europe, outside of Asia, spread it out and, and, and dominate the rest of the world and capitalize the rest of the world. But because those uh, countries, those parts of the world are not united, not knitted together, have no activated working class, their response to this is wholly asymmetrical, and they are in peace defeated. 
except for the Chinese, who come a little late to the party because they've had this dominating uh, imperial structure and the cyclical spiritual relationship. But by the 19th century, that starts coming under uh, pressure too. And first you get the Taiping Revolution, an attempt to bring Christianity to the fore and use the Christian millennium to get people to act. But by 1945, that's gone too. That's been extinguished by a, a, a century of, of conflict. And it's replaced by, uh, by communism, another European import, another teleological import, because you have to have a straightening of the mandala to, in the modern context, direct social forces. But the late 19th and early 20th century is when the real battle begins, because you have organized working class in the, Ameri in the, the cities of the West, politically ex expressive, mobilized to one degree or another, in the sh on the shop floor, at the ballot box, and uh, on the military parade ground, to one degree or another, throughout Western Europe and the United States. They're in conflict with the state, in every case. Some places it's more violent than others. The U.S., very violent. The most violent. of uh, Outside of South America, of course, which is just America, but, uh, you know, because there was less of a, uh, a European settlement and the more of a, uh, a maintaining a domination over fixed colonial agricultural relationships that are not really overturned. Uh, it, it expresses itself more violently, but it's violent everywhere. And that violence gets to a point where these capitalist states start having to reform around the turn of the century and allow for mass politics. But, but this gives the mass access to technologies. Like, oh, now, oh, now workers can make their own militias and have the same guns that, uh, that the uh, army has. They can use the technology like the printing press and later radio to reach people. That they can uh, use uh, social mechanisms of organization like the labor union and the, and the political party to express their interest. This is a conflict. This is stress. That stress has to go somewhere. So it goes out to the empire. We can solve this problem at the center by soothing it with colonial exploitation. And it works for a while, but eventually, once you have enough comp competition and the latecomers like Germany show up at the trough, that's the important thing. You've got countries like Germany emerging on the world scene late because they came together as single polities late and coming to, the, to try to solve their social problems with the same colonial ex uh, expansion that the other ones had. They come into conflict over those things you have a global war that is the expression of this sublimated class war at the center of capitalism. And this should have emerged, all of the leading socialists thought it would, uh, once the, because first you have the attempt to have the working class parties and uh, unions of Europe uh, refuse to go to war. But of course that fails because while they have been built up, they haven't been built up long enough or durably enough to make that challenge. The time isn't right yet. The, mo the, the degree of militancy doesn't meet the moment. Because it's one thing to fight a war positions in peacetime, but when it's, hey, there's a war, we're going to fight the other powers of Europe. That raises the stakes very fast. And the state is able to match that bet in a way that the labor-based civil society can't. And so they folded their hand. Where didn't they fold their hand? In the United States and in Russia, the farthest, the places where the working class was farthest from power, but for two different reasons. In America, because we developed this frontier of free real estate, we had this yeoman society that had abolished the the uh, the peasant relationship. And then we have Russia, which has never got developed. They had the nineteenth century, they had the twentieth century dropped on their doorstep in nineteen hundred, on, on on a feudal doorstep. They are almost completely defined by the peasant relationship. Either way, uh, socialism, the, the, the creation of a socialist machine, is absent because that working class engine is, is uh, much weaker. So their stakes are lower. They can say no to the war. You're closer to power, you feel more responsibility. Well, if we're the German Social Democrats and we don't vote for war credits, they're going to kick us out of power because the people are also nationalistic. Well, shouldn't we stay in power? Isn't that better than giving up these controls? Yes. And then they do it, and there you go. It's over. 
then the war ends with revolutions with r real social conflict in almost all these countries, which was inevitably going to happen because there had to be, it was going to return to the metropole and to the countries that lost, it was going to return harder. And it did. The thing is, the country that lost World War I, the worst, was Russia. They lost so bad that they were effectively out of the war uh, a year early because they're because their working class was so uh, we feeble, so was their bourgeois. So they couldn't make a bourgeois revolution. They could try, and they had a thin veneer, uh, veneer of one. But it could not hold power, which is why the Bolsheviks were correct to rise in October. There was no... What, what everybody else thought, the Mensheviks and the SRs thought is, uh, we'll, let, we'll let them cook. But the thing is, they were not going to cook. They were going to be overthrown by the military because the bourgeois was not strong enough to do it. But the thing that got them going out, out and seizing was not just that, the tactical thing, because the tactics only get you so far. The Bolsheviks were religious believers. They believed in this extension of the cosmic conflict between good and evil that is going to be resolved at Armageddon. The, the, the thing that fueled Christian eschatology, the, the, the heart in the heartless world that Marx talks about when he talks about religion. But the thing that made them Bolsheviks in the first place and able to recognize the moment and able to act so decisively is because they thought, we're going to trigger a world revolution that is going to, even if we die fighting, we will die building something. We will not surrender to capitalism, which means we will die together, either in par either paradise we've built on Earth or a paradise of action where we are building something. Marxist Luther, Sock Dems as Lutherans, Bolsheviks as Calvinists, Anarchists as Anabaptists. Ah, perfect. This is all very facile, but I think it is true and meaningful to point out because God didn't go away. And it's just not, God isn't where the language of God is. That's what I mean. Because the working class was defeated in 1945, and the institutions that would have propelled working class towards a conflict with capital in the 70s, which was which is what happened, where it becomes a world system, becomes self-enclosed, it can no longer expand outward, and therefore will begin to eat itself. The thing that happened with Trajan, the thing that happened with uh, the Ottomans, the thing that's now happening to the United States. And we have these, we had institutions that could uh, articulate a social vision of, uh, of apocalypse to go with the religious fire and brimstone nihilistic uh, fantasy of oblivion that uh, Christians believe in. But now that's gone, and we live in, in the world where Satan won the Battle of Armageddon. Now that doesn't mean we're damned, though. That's the beauty part of it. It just means that the uh, world as we know it will never be reconciled to us. But we will all, as people, be reconciled. Uh, maybe I'll talk about this next week, but this is the gist of what I'm trying to talk about. I, 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 I want to get this across. Oi. Stay free, people. Bye.